Alexandra Bastian is the co-founder of the Imperative Fund. For her entire career, Alexandra has worked toward gender, racial, and economic justice. She led the financial stability grant making strategy at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which included a focus on benefits access, EITC expansion, free tax preparation, cash assistance, and basic income. Prior to joining SVCF, Alexandra was senior associate at Policy Link where she led a variety of projects related to advancing economic opportunity, including federal tax policy, workforce employment policy, addressing government issued fines and fees, and the development of policy agendas to advance financial security. An avid messenger on the consequences of a growing racial wealth gap, Alexandra was invited to present at TEDx on what key policies are needed to address it. Prior to joining PolicyLink, Alexandra was a 2012 to 2013 cohort member of the Proteus Fund Fellowship for Diversity in Philanthropy and served as co-executive director of the Young Black Women's Society Incorporated. Alexandra holds a Master of Public Policy degree from the Heller School of Social, for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Boston College. Alexandra was also a Connecting Leaders Fellow with the Association of Black Found Foundation Executives. Ooh. Chelsea believes, Chelsea Brown, Chelsea believes the power of change looks black and young. Most recently, she served as the External Opportunities Coordinator at the Seed School of Maryland. She works daily to provide, where she works daily rather, to provide students of color opportunities locally and internationally. Prior to this, she worked as a development assistant with Seed Maryland. There, she helped raise more than 600,000 annually and worked with local Baltimore leaders such as former Governor Martin O'Malley and Kevin Lowes. She worked as an operations management consultant with the Seed Foundation, managing a database of more than 3,000 individuals, organizations, and corporations. And in 2015, she created the Chelsea Brown Scholarship, a fund given to support a Winthrop University student of color annually. In 2016, she was invited to serve as a member of the board of directors with Winthrop University Foundation, making her the youngest and only woman of color on the board. With more than four years of development experience, she has worked with Educational Testing Service, MTV Networks, Charlotte Hornets, and more. Currently, she also works as an associate with Barber & Associates LLC, a fundraising firm founded by Anna Barber, former senior major gifts officer of the NMAAHC. In 2017, she received the Diverse Community Scholarship through the Association of Fundraising Professionals International Conference, and in 2019, received the Charles R. Stevens Scholarship for AADO Case Conference on Diversity philanthropy and leadership. Last year, she worked with the Association of Black Fundraising Executives as a philanthropy fellow through the University of Maryland's Do Good Institute. More recently, she completed her time as the William Randolph Hearst Fellow with the Aspen Institute's Philanthropy and Social Innovation. Outside of philanthropy, Chelsea is a creator of a Mimosa Wasted product, pro podcast, rather, and the co-founder of the Black Creek Festival. Chelsea earned her Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communications from Winthrop University and is currently in the Master of Public Policy program at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. There we go. Anthony Edwards. Anthony is a team leader with the ability to teach, mentor, motivate, maximize productivity, and improve efficiency of an organization. Anthony is a full stack developer whose primary languages are React Native, Ruby on Rails, Ruby, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Anthony graduated from Fordham University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and joined Building Block as a junior full stack developer in 2014. In 2019, he was promoted to the role of Chief Technology Officer at Building Block, whose software manages over 50,000 projects worth over $800 million. At Building Block, 
Anthony organizes scrum meetings, designs and writes tests, assigns tasks and his and trains his team members. In 2016, Anthony and his co-founder bootstrapped their company, Eat Okra Inc. Eat Okra currently has over 55,000 downloads. In 2018, Anthony started his software development and consulting company, Lily Bytes. He works on he works one on one rather with businesses business owners and provides a software solution, as well as technical review documents used to implement his client's vision. He is a military veteran of nine years and has served in Operation Iraqi Freedom 2006 to 2007 as an avionics technical repairer. He was a shop maintenance manager and managed 26 soldiers daily activities. When he's not developing, Anthony has a passion for photography and other recreational activities. I do want to also add to that, that as of this year, Anthony's company has expanded and he now has over 300,000. I think we said it was Anthony downloads uh, within the past, I believe it was six to eight months. And last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Renee Jocelyn. Renee Jocelyn is a philanthropy advisor and strategist with more than 15 years of experience designing philanthropic approaches to advancing justice and equity around the world. Her focus areas include racial justice, gender equity, indigenous communities, and community-led movement building. Renee supports foundations and nonprofit organizations in the development of design development and design rather of grant making portfolios and structures for optimal program implementation and impact. Renee founded Philanthropy Unbound in 2012 to advise individuals, families, foundations and corporations in the development of philanthropic projects and strategies, including portfolio building, program design, landscape mapping and collaborative funds. In 2016, Renee started Philanthropy Unbound to incubate and provide resources, resource development advice to social justice organizations. Most recently, Renee was the director of Girls and Women Integration at the Clinton Foundation, where she concentrated her efforts on empowering girls and women worldwide. In this role, she advised philanthropists, NGOs, and multilateral institutions on increasing investments in gender-focused initiatives. Prior to the Clinton Foundation, Renee was senior advisor at the Tides Foundation, where she developed and directed grant-making portfolios in women's health, human rights, economic development, and social justice. Additionally, she formed and administered the Indigenous Women's Fund and the Africa Family Planning and HIV Integration Fund. Prior to the Tides Foundation, Renee served rather as director of corporate and foundation relations at the MIST Foundation for Women, where she developed co-investment partnerships in the areas of economic development and reproductive health and rights, youth-led social justice, social change, and civic engagement. Renee holds an MHS degree from Lincoln University and a BA in political science from the University of New York at Buffalo. Shout out SUNY. And so now I will turn it over to Maria Smith Dautruch, who will uh, take the program over from here. Thank you, Colin. And hello, New York Urban League Young Professionals. Uh, it's good to see y'all. I was loving the chatter in the chat because, you know, only going to bring the best to the best. So um, I thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, and let's just jump into this panel. Before we do jump in, either give a reaction of a hand clap, give me some, you know, fingers or clap it up. Colin just did a lot of reading. Reading is fundamental. Shout out to Colin, putting it all out there for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I thought he might do a highlights reel, but he said no, verbatim. They got these bios, I'm gonna read them. I like it, Colin, thank you. So um, I'm just going to jump right in. Y'all read, y'all heard the bios. We've got a great lineup, got a few questions, and I really want a rich conversation. And I want to save as much time as we can for Q&A. So, um, you know, maybe if you want to throw some questions in the chat, I promise to get to them. And uh, let's dive right in. I'm going to um, ask this question 
of all the panelists first. Um, and I'll, I'll say with names who should answer in what order, just so we're easy with the flow. Um, I'm gonna say some words and phrases that are both linked and distinct, right? So tell me from this list, which one resonates most with you and your work and why? Here's the list. Collective economics, wealth and wealth building, philanthropy, giving, legacy building, and inheritance. I'm gonna to go to Chelsea first. So get ready, Chelsea. You're gonna tell me which of these words resonates most with you and your work and why. Collective economics, wealth and wealth building, philanthropy, giving, legacy building, and inheritance. Take it away, Chelsea. Absolutely. Um, firstly, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it seems I want to move to New York. You guys are doing some amazing things with the New York Urban League Young Professionals. So thank you again for allowing me to um, sit in. So for me, legacy building is always how I describe my work. Um, I think philanthropy and fundraising is, is great, but I think legacy building really gives it an opportunity for people to understand that you are here to leave some sort of impact, right? And whether it be investing in your um, college, investing in an initiative, investing in um, a nonprofit, you're there to make sure that the world is a little bit better because you are in it, right? Um, and I think as the work that I continue to do and the research that I'm continuing to do, we're learning that Black people as a, as a culture, right? We're taught to be philanthropists, but we're not necessarily named that, right? So we give to our churches, we give to the things that we want to kind of, we have impact in, and that's what we're taught. But as we get older, we don't see ourselves as philanthropists. And so I think a word that makes it, I guess, a little bit scary, right? A, a little less scary for me has always been building a legacy, right? Because I think it's easy to kind of correlate with. So whether you're giving back your time with the board or giving back your time with community service, um, or giving funding, right, to an opportunity or cause that you're interested in. I'm always thinking about how we as Black people, how I as a Black woman can continue to build my legacy so that when people see something, they say, oh yeah, Chelsea Brown was a part of that, or she was able to invest in that, and that's why, or that's why it's continuing to move forward. Um, and so legacy building is always what I like to use, kind of what I do um, in my field. Got it. Thank you, Chelsea. So Chelsea's legacy building. I'm gonna take it to you, Alexandra. The words again, collective economics, wealth, wealth building, philanthropy, giving, legacy building, inheritance. Which one of those resonates most with you and your work and why? I mean, all, all of those, those words really resonate, um, but I, I think I will go with, um, I think I'll go with collective economics. Um, and the reason I'm going to go with that is because even though the work that I'm doing is very much about philanthropy and it's very much about legacy building, um, but one of the things that we have been continuing to emphasize with the imperative is that we have to choose to do this work collectively. Um, so the, the imperative is a new fund um, focused on the wealth, health, and connectedness of Black people. And um, those focus areas have an international lens, a global lens, because Black people are suffering racial injustice and they're suffering economic injustice wherever we are, quite frankly. Um, and you know, we're looking to we're we're looking to create new bodies of work to give space for Black leadership to innovate in those areas because traditional philanthropy may be a little bit uncomfortable if we start working on those things and prioritize our well-being like Maria's uh Mar Maria's um her bio talking about her being well rested how many of us can we can put that in our bio and be telling the truth and I can tell you that that is the case all over the world and too for too many reasons so um, I'm going to go with collective economics because we are putting out this idea that we want to create a long-term uh, endowment, a permanent endowment for the wealth, health, and connectedness of Black people, right? So it's permanent, so that means we'll be leaving a legacy. However, we're also saying that if we don't choose to be the ones who invest, especially to be the first investors, the ones to put, put that little bit of change that you have into the imperative, right, then we can't signal to traditional philanthropy um, the things that have to change. We have to do it 
first. We have to do it together and um, we have to do it for the long term. So that's why I choose collective economics. I could say more, but um, yeah, that was a fun exercise. Thank you, Alexandra. And I hope y'all heard what Alexandra just said there. She like, her and her co-founder have like launched a whole fund. Um, it just launched officially after years of, uh, about a year and a half, Alexandra, of work organizing, strategizing. Um, so the imperative fund, we'll get more into that later on, but I just want y'all to know that the resumes might be long to, to date, but we're, we're young, we're gonna keep going, we're gonna <laughs> keep pushing. Um, Thank you, Alexandra, again. Um, and you mentioned traditional philanthropy. So my almost kind of sort of traditional philanthropist here, I'm gonna call on Renee Jocelyn next, um, who is just a warm spirit and bright light. Um, so Renee, the words again, collective economics, wealth and wealth building, philanthropy, giving, legacy building and inheritance. Which one of those words or phrases really um, resonates most with you in your work? And please tell yeah. us why. Thank you so much, Maria. And you actually just gave me the perfect setup, right? Because it's philanthropy, right? Philanthropy <laughs> is my word. And the reason why is because I feel like it encompasses everything else, right? So I live my life and the way that I've built um, philanthropy unbound is also to reclaim the word philanthropy, right? So we know it now is like this traditional kind of ivory tower, money from the top down, um, but Black people have been living off of philanthropy and living our lives through a space of philanthropy from the beginning. And um, the word philanthropy actually just means love of humankind. It actually has nothing to do with money, right? And so if you love humankind, you love people, you love yourself, you love community, then it's going to be wealth building. It's going to be cooperative economics. It's going to be all of that. And so I think as Black people, like we've given up on kind of like claiming the word, but we have our giving society, um, our giving circles, we have our mutual aid societies, we have, you know, I'm Caribbean, so we have our susus and, you know, and, and other things where we build collectively and all of that is um, philanthropy. And so that's why my word, because I feel like it encompasses everything. Thank you so much. Come on, Susu. Come on, I just, I just doubled up a hand last week and paid off some debt. Look, don't See, there you me. go. <laughs> my first car on the Susu. Let's be clear. Come on. I'm going to set up a podcast called Susu Stories. Nobody knows that. I'm not doing that. I'm a racist on a Susu when I was a kid. <laughs> Look. It is a wonderful idea. Someone on this call, please just susu yep. stories. Mm -hmm. We got we got them lined up, please. Um, so let's uh let and I like I want to come. I love that definition. I want to hold that for a minute, Renee. Philanthropy said it actually just means the love of humankind. Love of yeah, that's it. That's all so, it means. It has nothing to do with money originally. And it's so funny how right now when we talk about it, it kind of almost is all about money. Always. Yeah, let's let's come back so let's, let's reclaim back. it let's reclaim the word let's yeah. put a pin in that <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to it all right so um anthony i'm gonna pull you in because um i just i want to know you know of all the words collective economics wealth and wealth building philanthropy giving legacy building inheritance what resonates most with you and your work and please tell us why yeah, Maria, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, New York Urban League, Young Professionals, thank you for having me as well. Um, and I do need to get a susu. Me and my wife were talking about that. So we <laughs> got to revisit that conversation we had a week, a couple weeks ago. Um, for me, though, I struggle with these words. I think I'm going to go with legacy building um, because legacy gives you the opportunity to touch the future. And it touches the future, whether you're there to witness it or not. And we want to make sure that we're building something that long, that lasts longer than us, rather in spirit uh, or through our character of who we are as people. And we want to just make sure, um, you know, the E. Okra name lives on, or the spirit of what we've built lives on, and that people are just there to build community, share, and, and grow. Thanks, Anthony. I'm actually going to stick with you in that because um, not only do you have your own business with the consulting, um, the software development and the, the technical things that you've, you've trained up for, like this is your practice. You've also developed this, this other company, right? Eat Okra. 
Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about Eat Okra and, and specifically what's your why with that? How did it come to be and why are you still doing it? So, so Eat Okra is, um, uses technology to bring communities together through one specific avenue and that's black food. Um, it came about because really out of a personal need for my wife and I originally, um, you know, she was new to Brooklyn we're both new together and uh, we wanted to really get to know, you know, get to know, know the city, know Brooklyn and what better place than to feed our bellies than to eat. So we wanted to really um, support black owned restaurants. And at the time it was actually during election year in 2016 that we started the app. So, you know, during that time it was really about supporting black folks and there's a big, you know, racial divide in that conversation. So, you know, at, building this app was sort of a form of our advocacy and being able to provide something that people could use that was tangible and usable for people to support black owned restaurants. Um, so I saw it as an opportunity initially for me to just advance in my career. Uh, there's nothing like building your own thing to show a, a future employer that you can do some stuff. Um, so it's a passion project, but it really started to evolve. More people started to download the app, started asking for new features, new things to do on the app. And we just kept building and building. And then eventually it became a legit business. We incorporated the business. And now, you know, fast forward, we're at like 300,000 downloads. We have thousands of people using the app daily and monthly. Um, we are, you know, some rest restaurants are seeing that people are coming to them because of what we've been able to build and um, provide that service that, you know, right now people need, you know, the restaurant business needs it. Um, it's those days of like relying on walk-in traffic have really just come to an end. So it's, you have to be on the internet now. We've kind of been in this space for a few years now that I'm glad people are noticing what we've been able to build. Yeah, I love that. And just to be clear, Eat Okra, the app that if any if anyone has not downloaded yet, perfect opportunity to go download it. And um, it started in Brooklyn, but where are you now? Where, where If I'm in another city, can I be on Eat Okra and locate a restaurant? How, yeah, how yeah. What's your reach? Yeah, it started in Brooklyn, right? And then it was like, all right, what about the boroughs? And then it's like, well, if I'm traveling, what, what about what then? So we're coast to coast now. We try to cover most major cities, if not all of them. We have about 37, actually close to like 4,000 listings now in our app. And um, we're expanding to food trucks and eventually catering and online shopping. So download the app. <laughs> that is so cool. And that is a great legacy. I'm always surprised when I don't show when I get to a new city and no one gives me like a little black book of all the little black things I can do. Um, and I mean, in today's day and age, it would be an app, right? But um, also just want to throw out there because she is the person who connected us, Cynthia Gordon, uh, Cynthia Gordon Giwa, uh, co-founder of Black Owned Brooklyn, who connected us. And we'll come back to the importance of connections as a, as a way to build together as well. Um, so I'm going to shift back to, I'm going to ask that same what is your why question to Alexandra, another co-founder, took on a big project. It's bold. Um, I'm sure it cannot be easy. So please tell us why you are doing this, especially on days when it feels like it might not be going the way you want it to go. If those days exist, let me not assume. Tell us why. <laughs> Well, of, yeah, of course, of course, those days exist. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a few whys. Um, the first why comes directly from what I saw in my experience in philanthropy. Um, the sector, uh, we, we talked about this on, I, I, I love that, that Renee talked about, you know, the philos, the love of humans. Um, and we talked about this on our launch event, you know, philanthropy, has gotten so far away from really the heart of what the word is. You know, they've built institutions and bureaucracies, big bureaucracies that get in the way of the meaningful giving to, to those in need. And the giving to those in need is not supposed to be giving, but I wanna maintain control. 
I want to put money in this, but I want to maintain control. Um, and I saw that happen too much in my experience in philanthropy. And I also saw the, the, the reality, I have to be truthful, even in my portfolio that I was doing, it has to do a little bit with my location because I was in Silicon Valley, which has a small, you know, black population, but there weren't any black led organizations in my portfolio in at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And, and there was so many reasons. Um, and, and, you know, when you see the data that comes out about uh, uh, organizations of color getting, you know, cents on the dollar compared to what white led organizations get, those, a lot of those reasons um, pushed Ade and I to, to try to create something new, something that won't be easy for philanthropy to wrap its mind around because what we've built into it, into our, we've built into our design is that they don't get to keep the control over the work. You know, we built that into the way we're saying it. And even now in our conversations with funders, it's like they can't help themselves. Like they're trying to find ways that they can see if they can tamp down, you know, the, the thinking. And we purposely set it up to be broad and open and to say, we're just going, we're just going to create space for leaders to lead in these areas. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing. <laughs> but it's part of the, the push that we're trying to put on philanthropy to change, to let go a little bit of your all your models and all of that that you have already. And then we are also saying um, a couple of other things. Black people, when we're talking about racial justice, we're talking about even economic justice, Black people need to be the leaders on how we get to a new place because black people are the ones who have been suffering the, at the most, you know, and when it comes to those issues, right? Anti-black racism is at the heart of all of this, all of the policy problems that we are having. It is at the heart of um, the way capital flows across the world. Um, and so we just have to be honest to say, you know what, we're gonna liberate some capital. We're gonna do it so that black people can lead on the very issues that they have been the most impacted by. And we're gonna do it on a global scale because when, when colonizers wanted to take black bodies and bring those bodies over to the Americas, they used the tactics of divide and conquer. They separated existing tribes and then put them against each other, right? They told black people in Haiti that they're not good enough, right? Like that they can't lead on their own liberation I'm referencing, you know, my people, I'm Haitian, right? So, so, and, and Haiti will pay that price till, the, till now, right? If that, that, that risk that they took to lead. And meanwhile, we're still having that same fight all the time. We're still trying to get the police not to kill us. <laughs> we're still trying to get the government not to oppress us. <laughs> we're still trying to find our ways back to, to the cultural and historical things that actually worked for us. Right, like there were so many things in our cultures that got taken from us through separation, and so we're not going to put. Um, while we we're not we're not ignoring the reality that we all live in different places, but we're not going to to design this work to include those separations. No, the work if if it's happening over there, it's going to happen here, or it already happened here. If it's happening here, it's going to happen over there or it already happened there. And we just need to accept that reality and build our work and think about ourselves in, with that global context because that's where the future is. So I guess I'll stop there because I could go on. <laughs> but there, there's a lot in terms of just, just, being, just saying that we're creating a fund focused on the wealth, health and connectedness of black people is a lot. It's a lot for people to, and even for our own people, right? Like, are, do we even think that we should pay ourselves to work on that? Is that valuable work, right? So we're, 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 we're kind of pushing on the thinking of like how, wh wh what are we even doing? Um, and so, so that's, that's what we're, we're trying to do. That's our why, our multiple whys, and I could go on. <laughs> I was like, is this the masterclass, Alexandra? Oh, God. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had to, I had to stop my little timer. I was like, wait, let me just give the space, right? <laughs> yes, it's so much. It's so much. And when we think about um, the ways 
Like I want to go to Renee next for her why because of her original answer about reclaiming philanthropy. So much of the ways in which philanthropy has done harm in this country specifically has been, is tied to all that anti-Black racism and the need for keeping people in a position where they will have less while others gain more and the ways in which that wealth amassment at one level um, is honestly paying pennies on the dollar to just keep people exhausted enough to keep, to not dream. And congratulations for dreaming, Alexandra, really, um, really salute to you. Such, such a vision, bold, global, not designed with us in mind. You know, I love it. <laughs> and I've already donated. So, hey, join us. Um, and I want to go to Renee because, um, you know, you're on the side working with people who have things to give or are looking for ways to give. And so when you're working with these folks, even when you built philanthropy unbound, really, what is the why there? And specifically in moments where you encounter traditional or conventional philanthropy being itself, what keeps you going? Yeah, no, it's great to hear Alexandra's story because mine is like, very similar. Um, just working in this space for so long, working in space of philanthropy. And um, I was never a program officer. I was always on the um, individual giving side, right? So working mostly with individuals and individuals and corporations to actually support their philanthropy and build out program areas um, and do grant making that way, right? So if someone comes and says, I have $5 million that I want to give away in this particular area, build me a portfolio. So that's what I did at Tides and that's what I did at the um, Clinton Foundation with, with Corporation. And um, what is similar to what uh, Alexandria's story and what I find really interesting is that people will always come with kind of like this grand idea of what philanthropy should look like or what they want to give and how they want to give, but they never actually think of black people, right? It's like we're separate onto ourselves and we're not really part of any planning process. And the more and more I worked in this space with predominantly white people, um, is how I learned more of this, right? So when I would say, oh, I want to do, I want to add to your portfolio this organization. It's like, oh, well, I'm not doing racial justice, right? Or I want to add this. Well, I'm not talking about Blackness, right? And so my why is that as I went through that and continue to see that over and over again is just to remove Blackness as an issue area. Blackness is not an issue area, right? Blackness is part of every issue area, right? So if you're talking about food insecurity, if you're talking about climate change, if you're talking about economic justice, you're talking about um, girls and women, it's just, it's all, Black people are all involved in all of that. And so the more, and when I work with my clients, it's more so also as I build out a portfolio, kind of like sneak in, like organizations, like Black organizations and Black topics and pull that in so they can see us in our fullness. So it's not like, oh, I'm working on racial justice, so now I'm going to fund a Black organization. Right, or I'm working on racial justice, so now I'm going to talk to this Black woman, right? But how do you say, if I'm doing environmental justice, I'm doing climate change, where this is there, um, what communities are most impacted? How could I be most impactful? What organizations are already doing stuff around food security and food insecurity? Um, and how can I work with those and building that out? And I do um, similar, similarly with um, Indigenous communities. So that's, that was my why. It's like, I, I hated seeing us always as like put in this racial justice portfolio or the black portfolio throughout foundations, even with program officers, right? Like this is our black portfolio and this is everything else. I just wanted to merge it and make sure that people saw that we belonged in every issue area, um, in every portfolio and every program area. And so that's why I built out Philanthropy and Realm. And that's how I work with my clients. I love that. I even had to like write that down for myself. Blackness <laughs> is not an issue area. Blackness is a part of every issue area. It reminds me of how, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw talking about intersectionality. And That's when right. I listened to, um, you know, the president of the Shop Foundation one time had said, you know, I'm tired of these funders funding in silos, you know, right. as if as if people live their lives in silos. It's just not true so um thank you for lifting that for building it and i think one thing i just want to lift from that to make sure that the young professionals 
here specifically is that those of us in this work of philanthropy and fundraising, um, it's tough work, you know, a lot of work is hard work. This is specifically tough in that way, but also how often we need to be looking to leaders like you um, to see just how you, ha you had to build it on your own. It wasn't there for you in the field, in the profession. You had to take those skills and experience that and say, okay, I'm gonna build my own thing. And I think even in that way, the entrepreneurial spirit of black people showing up once again, even if it's not a private corporation, um, is something to be pointed out and, and applauded because it takes great strength to say, I'm gonna leave my good job. Cause let's be clear, <laughs> Silicon Valley Community <laughs> Foundation, uh, the Clinton Global Initiative, these are good jobs, okay? <laughs> these are the kind of jobs, you know, you know, Caribbean parents are like, good job, proud of you. And, <laughs> and you're gonna turn around and say, I gotta leave <laughs> um, because this is not serving my people long term. You know, I might be a little more comfortable, but we won't actually, you know, solve the problems that, that I see can be solved, that I know I can solve. So I thank you for your leadership. Then I want to look at Chelsea, who said, oh, I'm just going to, you know, go back to school and study this deeply. Like, while I'm also doing it, I'm going to be practitioner and scholar, setting up my own scholarship fund, but then going back and studying how this whole thing happened. So, um, Chelsea, please tell us your why, because we know that these graduate level programs applying for all these fellowships, <laughs> doing all this work, you would, you know, we know it's not easy. So when you're in there <laughs> doing it, um, and you've started a whole new, like you're a serial entrepreneur, honestly. Um, <laughs> you know, what is your why for this? What's going on? Yeah, so as most people say, I fell into development and fundraising. Um, and once I got bit, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. But what I kept noticing when I worked in Baltimore, I worked at a school that was 98% Black. Our leadership was Black. Our head of school was Black. Our teachers were Black. And in the development office, I was the only black person, right? So what I'm seeing, not uncommon at all, right? So what I'm seeing is we have white donors, we have white board members, we have white initiatives, we have white this, we have the white savior complex. And I just kept thinking, why would we continue bringing in white people to fund something that is for black students? That just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't make sense. And I remember talking to my supervisor at the time and I said, hey, you know, I, I was young and I was like hungry, right? So I'm giving her lists of black philanthropists in, in Baltimore and lists of black philanthropists in DC. Have we talked to them? And not the ones that everyone knows, right? But what are some philanthropists that maybe we're not thinking about or partners? And I remember her saying, I don't really care who gives all money is green. And I remember this kind of like feeling of like sunkenness. And I was like, is this the field that I want to be in? Is this? what people feel like white women in this field or white people in this field feel like, I don't care. I'm, I'm, you know, doing my thing, helping these black students, these black people. And if we have to get from white people, that's fine. And I remember thinking, well, I'm giving you the keys, right? I'm giving you black philanthropists. I'm giving you um, black foundations, black nonprofits, and you're intentionally not doing so, doing the research, reaching out to these people, et cetera. Um, and I remember thinking, yeah, I have to either continue seeing why this is an issue um, or leave, right? And so I stuck it out for a little bit longer, but at that decision, I said, okay, well, I'm going to go get my master's to see why we continue having this problem. And as I'm diving into my coursework, another point of transparency, um, I'm the only black woman in my specific specialization of nonprofits. So we're training white practitioners and not talking about diverse organizations. We're not talking about, about black led organizations. Um, more recently, I called one of my professors out um, for making an assignment where we had, we only could study for strategic planning, um, only study nonprofits or organizations that had $1 million of revenue. So I sent him this, you know, I'm thinking that's not inclusive at all. You know, we're not talking about black led nonprofits. We're not talking about black led organizations who actually may need free strategic planning support. Right. Um, and so what I'm finding in my graduate level coursework is that we're training these white practitioners in this field to continue practicing white people. Do you get what I'm saying? So we're not necessarily 
teaching them how to be socially conscious and 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 work with racial equity, right? Um, and so I'm always challenging in my coursework. The, the why is to break these barriers, right? And so I'm thinking about when I started my scholarship, I was the youngest person at Winthrop to ever do so. Um, and I remember calling and saying, yeah, I graduated two years ago. And they said, uh, wait, you know, that's not normal for, that's not an average donor age. And I said, I know you can do it. And I know you'll make it happen, right? But a lot of people at the age of 24, 25 don't have that confidence. They don't have that um, wherewithal or knowledge of philanthropy to be able to go up and say to a school, hey, I want to start a scholarship and I need your help with it, right? Um, and so once I was able to start that scholarship, then I'm getting people asking questions, right? How did you start that scholarship? I was just going to use GoFundMe. How did you start it through the school? How did you end up on the board, et cetera? And so it's, it's starting this wheel of, um, knowledge, right? Because if I can do it, you can do it too, right? It's not, it's not unattainable. And so my why has always been to make it, I want to make philanthropy attainable for a 23 year old. And I want them to understand that $5, if you can only get $5, you can only get $15. You are starting as a philanthropist, right? You are growing and just invest that in what you deem as a cause or a cause of impact. Um, and I think for me, my why, especially being in this graduate program and seeing again, the lack of diversity, the lack of discussion about diversity in nonprofits um, is to continue challenging these notions of like siloed, like what we just talked about, siloed funding um, and challenging these notions of barriers in regards to black funding and funding black people. So that's always been my why. I love it. I love it because what I what I hear from across the board is the why, if I could be so bold as to kind of like pull it together, is because we want to create the world that we want to live in and leave behind. Like, and we know we can. Like, we don't have to accept what we've been told it is because we know another way is possible and we are going to leave that. If I got to leave and start, if I got to push down the door, if I've got to break the barrier, if I've got to create the app, that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, even in all those different ways, you know, even the way Anthony's describing the app, it's not just, oh, so people can find Black restaurants. He's like, it's about connectedness, you know? And I think even in that language, there is just a way, I mean, I love us the most. I say that so much. And I'm specifically talking about Black people. I love us the most. It's because we just, the humanity we have, right? The fullness of it to be about this connectivity. And, and for, for colonizers to have known, the weakness would have been separating us. So as we think about the need for connectivity, one of the things we talked about in our prep call was like various levels of capital. So, you know, a lot of people might think, or some people might think, I know the early young professionals don't think this because they started a, a, a benefit fund for members of the young professionals when COVID hit, the family fund. So this is not like, foreign, give what you can, help each other out, make community. Young professionals are a captive audience, right? Um, but I'm thinking about folks who do feel like I just don't have enough. I don't make enough to be given. I got to stack my paper, secure my bag. And when I'm good, everybody else is going to be good. And I think one of the things COVID taught us is that um, that's really a false and thin veil. Like no one's really that good. And you have to just decide to give as you get. Um, and I think that reminds me, Chelsea, I think you were there when Professor Tyrone McKinley Freeman was talking about his forthcoming book. There's this um, professor, a black dude from New Jersey, but he's out in Indianapolis now. He's writing a book. The book is out. The book is out. Um, Madam C.J. Walker, um, The Gospel of Giving. And it's about how she not only thought of her giving as the money she could give, but the business she starts so that other people can have business. You know, she trained other Walker women. Um, and then she went out and she had these Walker women conventions. She would like convene them, bring them together. Like imagine your, you know, Mary Kay sales extravaganza. Like Madam CJ Walker was bringing the women together and not only teaching them how to have great business skills and business acumen, but also how to be advocates in their community for the upliftment of their people. She donated a lot of money to HBCUs, um, mutual aid funds. So I wanna bring it back to Anthony and then maybe touch again, Renee um, too, to, to chime in on this. The connection, right, in the black community between um, 
building up of Black businesses and giving in Black communities from a philanthropic, charitable, justice seeking, I'll put all those together, even though they're not all the same, through that lens. Like, how are we, what's your perspective of where we are in that? The state of Black businesses, I mean, 95% of which did not receive PPP loans, <laughs> um, and the state of Black giving. Where are we with that today? Yeah, and it's fun. Yeah, it, it, during COVID, you know, a lot of the restaurants were hit extremely hard, but they were still out there doing, giving food giveaways for emergency workers. They were still um, giving food to those who need, who were hungry, you know, and I noticed that off of the social medias and everything. And I was just so proud to see that even during this time of, of uh, grieving, really, um, they were still giving, you know, in this that philanthropy that, that makes it all stake. And we're just happy for E. Ochre to be able to support them in any way we can, which is, you know, just providing extra resources and information for people to find them to continue their mission to support the community. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that and also say that um, this whole community giving and the way the businesses give, right, and the way that we give as community, and, and it's like it's in us. It, like, there's nobody that has to teach us this, right? Innately, we have grown up with it. We've done it in our churches. We've done it in our homes. Again, you know, when we talk about the giving circles and the ways that we give to our neighbor, if somebody's house burned down, two doors down, they were living with you for a month, right? Somebody didn't have food, you were giving them food because that's just what we were taught and we were taught community. And I feel like that's sometimes why um, I feel like folks are jealous of us because we are a beautiful people and we give automatically from our soul just because like it's no like, well, what are you getting back from that? What are you... And it's like, it's nothing, right? And I think that we've been torn down by the society that we live in to kind of feel like there's something wrong with the way that we live and the way that we give and that our giving is part of who we are. And so we've, we've torn that down within us and right and created this kind of like anti-Blackness within us about like, oh, that's not posh or that's, you know, that's not this so or that's just, and it's, and it's something that's been like beaten into us of like who we are and not good enough. And then we express that in so many different ways. And then we create our own like anti-blackness, right? Like, so if that person isn't doing this and not buying the Chanel bag and the Lubu heels and, you know, and the Gucci and all of that with their money, then what are they doing? Oh, they're, they're working with family or they're helping this other person that doesn't make any sense. They're just doing that for whatever, right? Um, so again, just reclaiming the idea of philanthropy and what it means to us and who we are, like, Without giving, when you talk about giving circles and the fact that especially in the South, like they're all over and they could give to community in this way, like from barber shops and from um, like small kitchens, like in homes, like you had that woman, I can't remember where she was from, um, who passed away and then had like millions of dollars that her, then her children created a foundation. Oh, and she was like a cleaning woman, right? Like she would do laundry for a white family and just kept that money. Um, in order to feed like community and, and self and, and family and make sure everybody's good. I think that we just need to lean into the fact that we just are good people, right? And and embrace that and use that and live that way. And then and then stuff like, you know, Georgia and Stacey Abrams happens. <laughs> we just kind of lean into who we are and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, black people are this. Black people, we've been that, we've been that. So we just need to um, lean into that. And I see more and more as I see black people starting businesses, they've already developed like giving back into their business plans, right? And now other people like white folks are like, oh, that's a good idea, let's do that. But it's like, that's already who we are. Tithing is a thing for us, like a serious thing. Like my mother, God rest her soul, she wasn't even working anymore. She, her, her social security check, she was still tithing on that. I was like, mommy, like, who does that? How you tithe on social security, right? Like how you tithe on your pension? Many but and all black church are. people are tithing on social security. And Why tithing on their social Look. security? You're 65, retired, live your life, take all your money. No, I got to get back to my church. I got to get back to my community. So I think it's just part of who we are, you know, and then we need to stop trying to even explain it. Just, just be it. Just lean into it. I love it. I love it so much. And um, I want to just 
say out loud in case people aren't following the chat. If anyone has any questions for our panelists, for the panel, any specific one or anyone in general, please put them in there. Um, I do wanna be conscious of the time, but also invite folks to make this even more interactive. I could go on, I got questions, I wrote them down, but um, definitely wanna make sure that the young professionals also get a chance to, to ask you questions that are on their minds. Um, I wanna, I wanna, you hit on something that makes me wanna go off script a bit, Renee, um, and definitely want Alexandra to weigh in on this one. Um, and it comes to that internalized anti-Blackness. And we don't really talk about this a lot when it comes to like fundraising philanthropy, um, collective economics, wealth building, but logically, right? If you don't think you're worth it, why would you do it? right? Why would you invest in yourself if you're never going to be enough? And so when you talk about doing work, Alexandra, that is for the connectedness of Black people, can you tell us some more about what that looks like mm -hmm. um, and, and how you envision the Imperative Fund being able to, to resource that really important work? Yeah. So um, I do think that Renee hit, hit it right on the head because she said, this is who we are, this is what we do. Um, and the, what I would add to that is the reason why we're gonna help the neighbor down the hall if, if their building burnt down is because I can't win if you can't win. <laughs> like, like if you're on the street in front of my house, <laughs> right? Like and you're sitting in front of my doorway, <laughs> right? Like I, I, I can't just walk over you and leave you there. <laughs> how, how do I win if you can't win? And I think that that is one of the, the key things around our internalized um, oppression. That's what I would call our internalized oppression, our internalized anti-Blackness. Um, and I think that that is the opportunity at the same time. It, I think that, that um, the part of the why of why we need to do this this way is actually, I believe firmly that the future is going to require this. <laughs> the, the next generation coming behind us, they ain't gonna be playing these games. <laughs> and we need to put some things in place so that they have um, leverage when the time comes. <laughs> we need to put some things in place so that they have deep understanding of who they are in a full way, not just based off the narratives that we have been told that that tell us to internalize our 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 uh, an, to internalize anti-blackness, right? So, um, I, I think that um, you you were asking about the connectedness piece, like just un if we could just simply understand basic concepts of I am because we are. I can't win without you. If I if we seek economic liberation here in, in the US, right? If Black Americans somehow achieve economic liberation, right? What happens? <laughs> like what hap do we what what happens? What what really will happen, the truth, right, of what really will happen is that if we have not done some work on changing our perspective of, our, of ourselves, then the generations after that are coming from developing countries, they'll just come with those same ideas that we did the work to dismantle. So if we don't break free from false boundaries, if we don't break free from internalized oppression, um, we're setting our future generations up for trouble. And 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 I, that's a whole that's a whole body of work of of thinking that we need to help people see, and that's one of the things that the fund wants to do, right? We want to. That's why we keep saying what we're doing is creating space because there's so much um, um, uh, thinking and creativity that is being stifled because of our current constructs, um, especially within philanthropy. Obviously, larger than that. But, but in philanthropy especially, so many people who understand how we are all connected, they are not the ones that, that traditional philanthropy wants to fund. Because, you know, they might hold a mirror up. <laughs> they might hold a couple mirrors up. <laughs> and um, we're trying to find a, a, a meaningful way to hold some mirrors up right now, but hopefully in a way that actually leads to impact. So, you know, we are connected. Yeah. Uh, I, 
the last thing I'll say, the la I just want to say one more thing about that is that hopefully you all saw um, after all the protests, right? We had protests, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, all of that. And then what happened? You see an NSARS movement in Nigeria, right? You have young people in Nigeria, young black people, and they're being oppressed by their own government. And that government is mimicking the ideas that they see here in the US. The, the response that that government gave to NSARS was to create a SWAT team, right? And so that's what we're saying is like, we can try to win, <laughs> but actually the way we will win is if we change our perspective on our collective selves. And, and I think that is how, you know, the connectedness piece really, really comes to play. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for those who did not know that this was about to be an education of this, this level. <laughs> and you just thought you get a list of black businesses you could buy from next Saturday. Uh, also, you can probably do that. But um, the chat lit up in a way that I have, to, I have to pull something out. Bianca put something in the chat that just, I'm, I'm, I'm sprinkling. She said, black elitism is a barrier. The talented tenth is a barrier. And why is that hitting me so funny? It's because, um, you know, for years, and I don't know if it's over, but for years, there were people calling the National Urban League out <laughs> as being a barrier to the space being created for, um, you know, and I, I, Bianca, I don't want to call you out to say more about it. If you want to keep chatting, please keep chatting. But um, let's, let's talk about, as we're thinking about access to capital, be that monetary, social, whatever, the capital, the currency on which you're gonna run, right? So access and also, um, you know, it's not about aptitude, but it's about, do I have the tools, right? And let's talk about the ways within our own community that class and uh, someone else through in color, what are the things that we within ourselves need to work through when it comes to thinking about how we are as philanthropists and also how we are as Black business owners and supporters. Because let's not front, let's get real comfortable family. It's already 755. Some of us walk into Black establishments and knows way up in the air. They're taking too long to serve me. This is kind of dingy. I don't like, I don't like, this ain't right. Um, and, you know, similarly with, with funding, you know, I have heard Black philanthropists of a certain economic status talk about people that live down the block from them the same way white folk who live 10 zip codes away talk about all of us. So I think if we can suss a little bit of that out in the last five minutes, <laughs> I feel like um, that'll be an interesting note to try to lean out on, but maybe people will give us a couple more seconds to finish on a different note. But I feel like we've got to honor what was in the chat right there. We got to honor, if it is about collective, right? We've got to honor that all of us are not on the same page. Yeah, I, I would say that goes back to the internal oppression conversation, right? Like we, we feel like we have to be, so just as much as we love ourselves and, and we love our people and, and we come from love at the same point, at um, the same time, we see so many arrows pointing in our direction and we're looking at that. And so we want to say like, I'm not that person. I'm not that Black. Right. Don't do that. Don't put me in this category. And so we internalize that. And we, I remember um, just hearing stories about like, you know, my like I said, my parents are um, Caribbean and and like this, there's this divide, divide against who's black and who's not black. Right. Who's black enough. Right. Then um, I saw colorism in the chat. Like, what is the paper bag test? And then you see on television, right, you, the black, the men, the husbands and the sons are black. Right but the daughters and the wives are biracial. <laughs> so it's like, what is that kind of like internalized oppression that we're doing, um, that we're feeling and we're causing amongst ourselves? And so I feel like there's this, this way of us also internalizing this idea that we're not good enough. And since we don't feel good enough, we have to look for someone else to look down on. And unfortunately, we have been the people that everyone else has been looking down on. And so the only way we have to turn is the other people who look like them. 
and then and parse it out that way and then continue to um to ride on some conflict uh, conflict in that way and so that's the unfortunate part about blackness and if we could just come together and understand that we are all like if you come from Trinidad you're black you know, if you come from Nigeria, you're black. If you come from America, you're black. Come from Haiti, you're you're black. And like, what is blackness? And define it in a way that people don't always have to other us. Right? I'm black, but I'm not that black. I, I'm this kind of black. I'm black like this, not black like that. Right? And so I think it's, it's something that we have to grapple with, and we've been grappling with it for a long time. You know, since the talented tenth, and even before then, the paper bag test, the, the doll test. We've been grappling with it and I think we have to uncover it. And I don't know how we begin to do that, but it's a real conversation and it will stymie us every time. Yeah, from the one drop rule. Space. We create space to have the conversation, <laughs> right? Like where, what- That's what, right, that's the right. Philanthropy is paying us to do this work. And that is the whole point. Right. So I just wanted to say that's how we get to it. It's like we have to find some space to start having the hard conversations. And it costs money. It does. <laughs> I mean, we, we were all clapping up at the time about how I'm well rested, but I had to say no to a lot of stuff to get my yeah. to reclaim my rest. So tell me you were coming in. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I I see just kind of like on this fundraising note, I'm seeing it a lot more you know, after protests and, and things along those, those lines, you see a lot of money going to the same, maybe three to four historically black colleges and universities, right? And if, me being a South Carolinian, I, I know six in the state of South Carolina alone. And I'm thinking, why are we not giving to Benedict, Allen University, South Carolina State, Claflin, Morris College? Like, why are we not giving to these kind of smaller, lesser known, you know, historically black colleges and universities that could not saying that the top four couldn't use the money, right? But it hits a little different, right? For a, a institution that doesn't give get as much funding, doesn't get the notoriety, doesn't get the um, kind of publicity that some of these institutions get. And so I'm starting to see that a lot more because it's easier, right? It's easier. Oh, well, these institutions are recognizable and we can easily get that access. And, and I think sometimes, and I think what I'm seeing a lot of the time in uh, philanthropy is in regards to, Black people in power and philanthropy is who ain't, who ain't kinfolk um, are not willing to do the work, right? It's going to take work to get to a Benedict or Allen University because they've never, they may have never had that connection before, right? And so although it is easier to contact these other institutions, why not do the work, put a little pressure on it to make sure that you're funding not only these big known ones, but also the ones that could also use the help that are a little bit smaller as well. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to the funding way as well. Also, this is a whole, we need our own little fundraising philanthropy coffee hour. I'm gonna host it on my own Zoom. I'm gonna invite, we gonna finish this. But I do, <laughs> I do want to um, bring in Anthony on the business side, because I did raise, you know, how people look at black businesses. And, you know, it's real, it's real cute when you got 300,000 downloads to say, oh, this started as a passion project you know, versus when it's not working and people are like, Anthony, it's time to give up this hobby and go earn some money, hashtag good job. So, you know, what is it? How, tell, tell us how we got from, my wife and I were new to Brooklyn and we were looking for how to build community here to we are legit a business. I mean, honestly, let's be honest. We're talking about something that happened in the same amount of time it took us to have an occupant in the White House and now kick him out. I know four years has felt long on that trajectory, but on I'm gonna build a business trajectory, that is not a long time. So if you could just um, let us know what's up with that four year journey you've been on and how it's been for you accessing opportunities and capital and relationships um, as a black business owner. Yeah. Um... Man, it's been a journey. Um, my wife and I, we didn't raise money or uh, seek to raise money in this venture. Uh, one, because it's a headache. It's a lot to do. And two, I didn't, I didn't know too much about it. Um, so I kind of just shot away from it. So, but fortunately, I'm a developer. So those, those heavy costs were, were on me. My, my abilities was, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to build this. Um, but, you know, I've been getting up 5 a.m. in the morning working 
for a couple hours and go to my day job, spend time with my fiance, now wife, and then go to bed coding. And I did that for years. Um, so it's, it's a grind, it's patience. It's, it's seeing the bigger vision of it. It's um, just sticking it out, what you believe in. Um, you know, my wife was, she uh, was on and off with the project, you know, uh, she, you know, she had some, you know, her father passed away and we had a baby, we got married. So it was a lot going on, but, you know, she, she always stuck by me with the vision and, you know, now she's like fully on board with it, but um, we had a journey, but I, I also wanted to touch on the previous topic and, you know, as black folks, we definitely have to give each other grace. Um, we've allowed the not people that look like us to tell us how everything is supposed to work, how quickly we're supposed to get it, how um, I need it now kind of concept. And it's supposed to look and feel a certain way. And you have to understand, especially I, I speak on the tech side, um, that it doesn't always look the same. It's going to feel the same, but we're trying to get there. You know, nobody builds something that they just want to give you bad service, you know. Um, and with us, we get nasty comments from people all the time. Um, there's not enough black owned restaurants in this city. Why isn't, you know, like this not working or this working? And, you know, it's, we just try to be patient and nice with our responses, but, you know, just like have that in that message of just grace, understand like this is a black company. They, they are small, there's only two of them give them the opportunity to grow um, and, and just, just be patient with that. You know, there's a lot to that, more to say, but definitely grace. Yeah, I, I definitely feel you on that. I've been in my own life practice trying to be like, take a breath. You do not have to respond to the email first. You're not gonna get a, a gold star for being the first one <laughs> to respond or for having the answer first. And that just also creates anxiety and um, you miss the opportunity to have a second opinion in your own mind, right? And to really get to layered thinking for yourself. And I wonder how much deep black brilliance we miss forcing each other to work at the speed of white supremacy. Like it's not worth it, I don't right. think. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, um, I wanna wrap up because it's 8.05, chat's been live, but I don't think I've missed any questions. If I have, let me know. Y'all have been such an amazing panel that I'm pretty sure some great minds at the Young Professionals will get together and figure out how to make this a whole series. That, that's what I saw in the chat. But um, someone, someone asked if there would be like resources or links and, um, and we are, we, we thought about that. Thank you, Space and Grace to Grow. We thought about giving everybody resources and links and that will be shared afterwards. Alexandra just dropped the imperativefund.org. Anyone can make a donation of any size. I made a donation and I feel pretty proud of myself for it. Um, I really feel like I'm a part of something that, that we need. Um, and so I just wanna uh, leave with any call to action or resource. And it doesn't have to be, you know, yes, name the call to action, Alexandra, I'll let you do that for yourself for the imperative fun. But it could also be, I really think you should read this book or there's this really cool podcast about philanthropy. Or if you wanna know more about what it's like being a black fundraiser, for instance, you know, we need more black fundraisers. Um, Cause I'm getting out. Uh, so I think that it's, I think that it's important for folks to know that there are entry levels at all areas for calls to action. I just want to name that. But please, let's just go across. I'll kick it off with, um, with Chelsea. Some, a few calls to action, resources you have for people. And we will send out resources. Resources will be sent out to everyone on this call, to the whole general body um, after the meeting. Yeah, so I was actually going to say the Madam C.J. Um, Walker, The Gospel of Giving. Um, that book is phenomenal and it just reinvigorated me back into philanthropy especially as a black woman i would also say um decolonizing wealth is also great if you have not read it by edgar villanueva it is amazing and for lack of a better term he reads these white folks for filth and i love it so um it's amazing and then also an action but not really if you're thinking about starting your scholarship being on the board 
et cetera. Just do it. Don't overthink it. Just do it. Um, and I always say go in there with the confidence of a white man who doesn't know what he's doing. And so, yeah, that is what I think those would be my action items. And again, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Look, Chelsea, if you don't say what it is, I mean, we all know the stats, right? This is an urbanly young professionals group. White men apply for jobs for which they are qualified for approximately 30 to 40% of the listed job duties. Right. They just be like, oh, I could do two of these things. I'm, I'm in there. <laughs> so sometimes they don't even know how to do any of it and they still apply. Show up with the innate <laughs> confidence you have in yourself. You are the best. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Anthony, I hear you there. Come on, calls to action. What can we do? Folks yeah. have already downloaded your app, but say it again. Yeah, um, Chelsea hit it on the head. Like, just get in there and get it done. Start doing it. Um, don't overthink it. Fake it till you make it in some cases. Um, yeah, I, I see that a lot. People overthink and they, they study, they, they tutorial to death. Yeah. Just get in there and, and figure it out. Um, but yes, please download Eat Okra. Tell people about it. DM us if you have any questions. Um, add more listings. There's a form in our app where you can provide us uh, more restaurants that we don't have in our app. Um, make a post about it, tell friends, and uh, just keep, please keep sharing it. And uh, thank you. Thank you for the conversation. It's perfect timing too, because I'm pretty sure it's New York City Black Restaurant Week. So yep. check Through out. The- it's a great time to get down with Eat Okra. Um, okay, Renee, give us some, I should have yeah. said you for the benediction, but no, it's good. Go no, ahead. no, 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 no. Because <laughs> what I'm going to say is join the imperative fund. <laughs> I haven't yet. Just learned about it. I'm excited. I'm doing that tomorrow. So I'm going to do that for you, Alexandra, and I'm sure you're going to do it yourself, but that's where it's at. We need to do more of that stuff. Um, start a giving circle or just a community circle, something within your group, your family, your friends. If you're thinking about it and something is irking you within community, and again, I believe that all communities are our community, so it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, the climate justice is your thing, then get in there, start a group to do that. If you need any support in figuring out how to start a giving circle, build a giving circle, I am offering my services for free. You can contact me. I will help you make that happen. Because again, philanthropy, love of humankind, we're going to figure this all out if we do it together. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Wait, wait. I didn't even know we was dropping it like that tonight, (laughs) Renee. Whoa. Let me check in with your operations team because I, <laughs> I know the rates. So let me, oh, oh, I don't think people understand the gift that was just given. Y'all, if y'all want to start some fun giving circle, I just want to repeat, Renee Jocelyn said, reach out to her. She will pro bono consult you on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is, that's exactly why you support Black businesses because your Black business owners will support you when time comes for you to grow so i mean again i'm just looking through my files i know the rates girl i know the rates (laughs) you know god bless you (laughs) and now alexandra please what is the call to action from you yeah so so thank you renee i do hope that you all will visit the imperativefund.org um there is another website that's like imperativefund.com so we're going to fix that. Don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> um, but theimperativefund.org, um, make a donation. You can read our why statement, um, just hearkening back to our conversation earlier. Um, and I think the, the last call to action that I want to give, because I mean, I used to lead an organization and when I was a young professional, we targeted young professional Black women. And I know how valuable that space was for me. Um, and I say take advantage of the opportunity that you have to build skills through this this um, uh, YP group, this YP organization, um, because I cannot tell you the work that I was doing with that young with the Young Black Women's Society. All those skills get called on in my daily work all the time, like since the minute I left, which was ten years ago. 
So use this opportunity um, that you have with YP to get networks, right? Get connections, to learn, to, to try out your leadership skills. Maybe you're not great at leading a meeting, but you can learn how. Um, all of those things, if you enter into the space of philanthropy, I think those things will, will help, um, especially when you have to deal with the kind of nonsense that you gonna see. <laughs> if you have those, it's gonna help. So I just wanna say, take advantage of this opportunity. Can I say one more thing? Can I say one last thing? <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> it was one thing, something that, that, um, that actually that Anthony talked about earlier, which was just, you know, they were pursuing their own inquiry their own inquiry about where do I go get some food, you know, black businesses and support. Right. And I would say that in my journey, it has been the same where I was following my own inquiry. I was trying to figure out what was going on in my hometown, uh, right outside of Boston. I was trying to figure out what was going on with economically. Like, why is it that my mostly Haitian and Cape Verdean city gets all the bad rep? <laughs> And that inquiry has led me all the way to this. I kid you not. I have, I'm still trying to answer that first question. <laughs> and in my efforts to answer that first question, it has led me all the way to this. So I just say, pursue that inquiry that you have that you might be wondering about in, in your mind. Well, thank you all so much, Renee, Anthony, Chelsea, Alexandra. I'm so grateful that in the tradition of call and response, I put out a call, y'all responded. I really appreciate that. Um, 